DNA technology are methods that are used to study and manipulate DNA. Um, these can be used to produce recombinant DNA or a recombination of DNA, DNA from two different organisms. And the way that this is done, uh, one way that this is done, are with plasmids. And plasmids are circular um, sections of DNA that are found in bacteria. And <clears throat> these uh, can be broken with restriction enzymes, which will break that DNA, that plasmid DNA, apart at certain sequences of the A, T, Cs, and Gs. And that same restriction enzyme can be utilized to break apart the uh, DNA from uh, the organism that you are trying to extract it from. And so this could be a gene to produce human growth hormone or insulin, for example. And this gene can be isolated and cut away from the chromosome with a restriction enzyme. And then <clears throat> the plasmid can be cut with also a restriction enzyme and the two can be combined to produce a recombinant DNA. Um, plasmids uh, always have an origin of replication and this is necessary because uh, the idea behind producing recombinant DNA is to get the bacteria to produce lots and lots of this particular gene for us and we want to make sure that it can continue to replicate so keeping the origin of replication intact in the plasmid is important and then the other um, the other gene that we like to have in these plasmids are some type of antibiotic resistance site and this is important because um, you want to be able to screen these plasmids somehow to make sure that they're containing the gene of interest and so um, usually there's some antibiotic resistant site within the plasmid. Now one of the arguments against these uh, recombinant DNAs or GMs, genetically modified organisms, is that these uh, plasmids contain these antibiotic resistant sites and so if you get enough of these antibiotic resistant organisms out there then it makes our conventional antibiotics uh, not work so well when we need them in different times. Restriction enzymes, the, w the way they work is they'll, they'll cut, there's many different types of restriction enzymes, there are hundreds and hundreds of them, and they'll cut at particular sequences. So if this was our plasmid, uh, we'll pretend that it would cut at this particular sequence here. And so um, here's our plasmid being cut, and then here's our DNA of interest, and it's being cut, um, same sequence. And what this does is it uh, produces um, just half of the strand of DNA on each of these places where it's cut, and this means that you have places where hydrogen bonds can form, and this is called a sticky end. And these sticky ends can uh, come together and anneal uh, in other words, they'll attach hydrogen bonds again, and in order for that to happen, there does has to be an enzyme present, and it's called DNA ligase, and this is what will be used to uh, kind of glue them together or paste them together. Um, that enzyme makes that happen. Um, so the steps in cloning a gene um, are here. So first you have to isolate the gene of interest, um, and find a plasmid that you're going to use um, as your vector. Um, and then you have to treat the plasmid and the DNA containing the gene of interest uh, with your restriction enzyme. Mix them together so that they become cut. Um, add the DNA ligase and then um, add the recombinant plasmid to the cell that it needs to go into um, and then allow the, the cell to replicate itself and that's going to produce the clone. In other words, that gene that um, has been placed in there. So if it was a gene to make insulin, for example, now we're going to have bacteria that are going to produce um, insulin and the bacteria will multiply very, very rapidly and then we can harvest the insulin from the bacteria and it's the exact same molecule that would be produced in your pancreas. Um, so um, it, it turns out that this is very, very useful. Um, if you subject an entire um, DNA strand to these restriction enzymes, you're going to end up with lots and lots of different fragments and this is going to produce a genomic library and this is the entire collection of the cloned fragments from the whole cell of the DNA. Now if we want to talk about cloning an animal, okay, or, or a plant, 
Um, you know, a plant clone is just a cutting from the plant and, you know, it grows the same. So most people have done that before they've cloned their plants. Um, cloning animals gets a little bit more tricky. Uh, and one general way in which that's done is the animal of interest, the one that you want to clone, the cell, <clears throat> every cell in that animal has all the DNA that would make another individual just like that. And so the idea is, is you take the nucleus out of that individual that you want to clone and you put it into the nucleus of an egg that's been stripped of its nucleus and then uh, that egg, that fertilized egg, is inserted into the uterus of a surrogate mother and then whatever the gestation period is later, then the clone would be born. So if you were cloning um, a human being, if I was cloning myself, I, I would uh, have to wait nine months before this uh, individual was born and then they would be starting out as a baby. Um, and so it would take them another half a century or more before they would uh, be like I am right now. So when you clone animals, it's not like you immediately get a whole army of clones that are exactly the same. Uh, and the environment also plays a role there. And we really don't have any um, alternative besides the uterus of the, the same species to bring that clone to life. So uh, that, you know, is a limitation as far as cloning animals go. However, we do clone many, many types of agricultural animals, high producing dairy cattle. Um, you know, there, there's really no end to the uses that we have of these. Um, another way that we can um, get our um, gene of interest is by using reverse transcriptase. And reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that's going to be able to allow us to start out with RNA, um, the messenger RNA, uh, for that particular gene. And um, then <clears throat> the benefit of that is, is that uh, the messenger RNA, when it's created, it's taken out all the interons or all the nonsense portions of the DNA. And so that can also be utilized to find, you know, have that gene of interest that you can use for cloning. Another uh, type of DNA technology that is very um, famous um, is DNA fingerprinting. And most people are aware of this because they know something about the forensic applications of using uh, a DNA fingerprint to identify uh, suspects in crimes. And the way that this works is in all of our DNA, and this goes for all organisms really, uh, eukaryotic organisms, you have interons and many of these interons are repeating segments, they're, they're short segments, they, they're like nonsense segments, we don't know that they actually code for anything in a lot of cases, uh, but there are enough mutations that accumulate in these that there are differences. And so these differences vary um, from individual to individual. And if you look at a number of these different locations in any individual, you can see that there are a number of different differences. And so these differences add up to very, very um, high probabilities or large probabilities. In other words, you know, one in a million, or I guess I should be using the word small probabilities, that anybody else would have the exact same combination um, as you would have. And so the idea is here is you take the DNA samples from the crime scene um, and you uh, subject them to a restriction enzyme and you put them in something called an electrophoresis chamber and there are different varieties of these. One type is called a gel electrophoresis chamber. And because DNA is negatively charged, um, you have a power source attached to these chambers and once you turn on the power, the DNA is going to migrate toward the positive pole. And when it does that, the smaller pieces are going to move faster because it's been cut by restriction enzymes. The larger pieces are going to move slower. And so you end up with this banding pattern. And this banding pattern uh, is enhanced by using uh, probes. And these probes might be attached to certain segments of DNA everywhere you have a CCC or it could be any combination you can imagine. Um, and so then you can look at the patterns and you can, uh, if you had you know, victim, suspect one, suspect two, you could look and you could see here's victim, or yeah, victim, and then suspect one, suspect two, and we can see that the banding patterns show that on suspect one and suspect two, uh, the blood from the victim uh, was on their clothing. It shows up very plainly there. Uh, and so we know that these two victim, these two suspects were at the crime scene where this victim was. 
And so this, this type of um, fingerprint is used in the courtroom to identify people. Um, it's called DNA fingerprinting, and it's really revolutionized the way uh, we fight crime, um, how paternity cases are solved, many, many applications. Um, a couple of the uh, breakthroughs that allowed for DNA fingerprinting, uh, one is polymerase chain reaction, also called um, PCR. And this was developed by Kerry uh, Mullins, he's a graduate of Dreer High School um, here in Columbia, South Carolina. And uh, the breakthrough came when he recognized that uh, the bacteria in the hot springs in Yellowstone were able to replicate their DNA and multiply and live happily in those you know, very extreme conditions. And so he, he was a very good chemist. He isolated the, um, the enzyme that was responsible for this, the uh, DNA uh, polymerase. And uh, using that DNA polymerase, um, he was able to set up a, a system, a machine called a thermocycler, which actually would uh, replicate the amount of DNA very, very rapidly. So in other words, if you have a DNA segment to start with at a crime scene, a very small amount, that's just a trace of blood, um, you can uh, extract the white blood cell DNA from that, which would be so small you might not be able to do anything with it. But with a, a thermocycler, um, what you can do now in PCR, what you can do is you can amplify that, or in other words, make more copies of it. So as long as you have the bases, um, the phosphate, uh, sugar, backbones, and the DNA polymerase, you ha and you have a you know basic solution to make this in, um, you can heat it. This uh, um, causes the, the DNA to unravel. And then when it cools, then it will uh, anneal and the new segments will attach to it and you heat it and then those segments come apart. And so you end up uh, multiplying the amount of DNA very, very quickly, um, an exponential increase. And so this allows for uh, material to do all the different types of DNA fingerprinting. It also um, has promise in doing things like uh, bringing back prehistoric animals. Uh, for example, we could take the cells from a woolly mammoth that might be very, very degraded and uh, we could use PCR to amplify the DNA in these organisms so that we could come up with enough DNA to actually um, have what would be necessary to make another woolly mammoth. And then we would have to go through the same cloning process like I just described and use an African elephant as a surrogate mother, or maybe an Indian elephant, I don't know. Um, transposons are jumping genes. And these were discovered by Barbara McClintock doing some very, very basic uh, types of genetic research, uh, very good genetic research. And what she figured out is that some genes actually move locations and they'll copy themselves before they move in some cases. And this uh, accounts for all these repetitive segments that I was just talking about that we take advantage of in DNA fingerprinting. Um, she also suggested that these are probably natural mut mutagens and they probably help generate genetic diversity. Both of these people um, were awarded the Nobel Prize for their finding. Both of them have really revolutionized the way uh, we do things um, in the modern world. All right, the largest um, contribution that DNA technology has probably made is something called the Human Genome Project. And this was the mapping of every A, C, T, and G in the human genome. They did this with a composite of individuals that represented the human species. And so we know on every chromosome what every A, T, C, and G is. And from this, we've been able to look at all the genes that make up a human being, all the genes that would code for all the proteins that make my body or your body. And it turns out that there's about 20,500 genes um, that have been identified that uh, make, make a human being a human being. Um, we've discovered more than 1,800 uh, disease-causing genes within the, this uh, genome, um, more than 2,000 tests for different types of human conditions and under over 350 different uh, applications of one sort or another gene therapy, um, and more being figured out all the time. It, it's really, um, you know, an unbelievable accomplishment that this has been done. Um, there have been many creatures that we've actually sequenced the entire genome of uh, mice, some types of roundworms, um, fruit flies. These are model organisms, and these uh, genomes help us to understand more about human beings also, um, 
this leads to some ethical issues, you know, uh, the eugenics business where, you know, you would create designer individuals that, you know, you either choose certain genes to uh, be in the population or not be in the population. So there's some real questions about how this information should be used. And there's also the, the worry that insurance companies and um, uh, employers may use this kind of information to discriminate against people who have some type of pre-existing uh, you know, genetic condition that may show up. Uh, however, the promises are also very, very great. They way outweigh any of the fears because um, what this does is it allows us to, to look at um, the genetic basis of disease and, and in some cases we can actually do something about these and do gene therapy where we can actually manipulate genes so that um, they won't express themselves and cause the, the disease that they uh, are uh, predisposed to do.